So I'm delighted to be joined today by Dame Laura Lee, who is the CEO of Maggie's charity, which is a cancer charity. Um, it might be slightly unusual for my regular listeners to wonder why I'm talking to you. Uh, so could you explain firstly what Maggie's charity is and what its links with architecture are? Um, yes, of course. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about it. So um, you're right, I'm, I'm not an architect and in fact my background is cancer nursing. And um, Maggie's is a charity that is um, there to support people with cancer and their family and friends and to support them with the, the challenges that cancer brings at any point in the cancer experience, whether or not that's through diagnosis to um, recurrence or bereavement. And, um, and it is to support them with the psychological and emotional, practical, um, financial um, aspects um, that, that can come along with that diagnosis. But one of the things that um, Maggie's have done in terms of providing this care is we've we have buildings where this care is delivered from on hospital grounds and each of those buildings have been designed by a different architect um, but an architect that has been given a very specific brief from us as Maggie's as the client to create a, a building that is also part of the care, um, that is part of um, giving people psychological and emotional support so the building is in a sense um, one of the strands within which Maggie's um, does its work um, with people with cancer. Mm. And it, it struck me that it's almost like a, a third space in this old sense of what pubs used to be in the sort of urban theory kind of realm, but for a very specific group of people, i.e. Like people with cancer. And that, because I remember first visiting, the first one I ever visited was the one just around the corner, um, Charing Cross, when it first opened. Um, and met Ren Poolhouse without knowing who he was as an architecture student, which was kind of <laughs> interesting. Um, so how do people use the spaces? How do the patients use the spaces? Because uh, it's a very strange kind of typology of building. Yeah, so I think you could describe the typology as being um, um, multifactorial, which in a sense is why I think architects quite enjoy um, the challenge of having to design a Maggie Centre because it's, it's part home, um, but of course it's not someone's home. Um, it's part it's part hospital because we're on the hospital grounds and people are coming in with sort of um, uh, clinical um, challenges. It, it's part um, it, it's part church in the sense that it's a place for people to explore their purpose and meaning of life and um, spirituality. And um, and it's sort of you know so it's that sort of a, it's amalgamating all those typologies um, together, which is why it's quite hard to define what a Maggie Centre building sort of is. Um, and it's part hospital, you know, being on that, that hospital grounds. So it's about giving a sense of professional excellence to the to the care that's being provided. And. And yes, community as well. Um, so a community centre where people can get peer support in a way that, you know, um, um, village halls would would be places where people could congregate and um, exchange ideas and and give support. Um, so it's sort of a mixture of many things um, all brought together um, rather so beautifully actually by our architects. Mm. Well, I read through your standard architectural brief earlier which is a very unusual brief as far as they go. And it's, I find it interesting that you give every, the same brief to every architect and sort of allow them to respond um, in their own way, I guess, yeah. to actually what are quite stringent standards in terms of the actual design and how the space works and that kind of thing. So how, how have you found different architects have responded differently to giving, being given exactly the same brief? Obviously not the same site, but the same. So yeah, so obviously each site brings its own sort of set of challenges. Uh, I think just to go back to the brief, I, I think the reason why the brief has been consistent throughout all um, 24 centres that we've, that we've um, built and um, opened here in the UK is, is, is because the brief is about how we want the buildings to make people feel. Um, and so, you know, behind the brief that you've seen, there is, of course, some functional requirements of the building in terms of the spaces that's needed. But 
function is one thing for an art and, and an easy thing for an architect to focus on, but actually, if, if you don't focus on how the building is supposed to make people feel, you can't retrofit that into um, a building at a later stage. And you know, no matter what you do with interior and colours of walls and rugs, um, that that feeling is it will never be there. So it's really important for us to emphasise um, how the building needs to make people feel. And, and that's, that's from every aspect of the building, from the toilet to um, the entranceway to the front door. And, um, and then I think the other wonderful thing about having worked with each, uh, different architects each time, because I think it's a, it's a common question we get, well, the first centre that we had done, which was by Richard Murphy, was brilliant. So why not just carry on working with Richard Murphy? Well, the second centre we're working on was Glasgow. Glasgow would not have thanked us for an Edinburgh architect doing a Glasgow <laughs> centre, so that was, you know, that was that was an easy decision. But I think working each time with a new architect means that they're coming at it fresh, um, and I think we at Maggie's as a client haven't assumed that we've that, that that we know what the right thing is, or that there's any one response to creating that 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 feeling and the atmosphere. And we sort of hand that brief over to the architect who, in our view, are an investigator of the social problem that we have at Maggie's of how do you make people who feel overwhelmed, um, who are facing uncertainty, who often don't feel valued or disempowered or out of control um, by a system that they're being processed. How do you contradict in a way all of the hospital experience and how do you um, create an environment that can sort of mitigate or or turn those emotions into positive ones of feeling more in control feeling valued feeling like um, life is still worth living even if it's within the moment that they're within the you know in the center because of the the views or the or the curiosity that, um, that, that the building stimulates that makes people feel alive and, um, and present. Um, so, so yeah, so it's a tall order for each architect, but I think we've enjoyed each architect, if you like, um, investigating what the other architects have done before, uh, learning from them and learning from some of their mistakes, um, and, also, and also coming at it fresh for the community that the centres located in. I mentioned Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, you know, they're different communities. And it's, it would also, we also did not want to fall into the, to the, to the sort of, we've got an institutional prototype for Maggie's, let's just roll it out. And so therefore they all become the same. And that part of Maggie's, um, way of being is each individual is unique and it re they require um deserve need a, a, a sort of bespoke um set of support that's right for them given their questions or challenges or or, or family or, or or way of being and that the the building should be bespoke for the community and not just something that we've previously done before and sort of looks looks the same. Mm. So I think if you visit each of our Maggie centres, most people would comment that they have a very similar atmosphere, but yet they're all very, very different. Um, you know, if you take, you mentioned REMS building, you know, it's, it's, it's very um, built into the landscape. It's almost disappearing. And then when people come in, um, they almost don't see the building, but they ex they're experiencing being in nature and they adore that sense of glass and light. And yet, if you visit Richard Rogers' building at West London, um, at Charing Cross Hospital, it's it's orange, it's bold, it's it's um, it's it's got a completely different sort of um, architectural aesthetic, but the feeling is very similar. Mm. Well, it's a strange mix of sort of a, a continuation of your brand in a way to look at it from a very commercial aspect and a continuation of things that will never change in the brief, the, the, the feeling of the space, the, the kinds of feelings that you need to um, help cancer patients with. But then also obviously the site changes and the community changes and probably the hospitals change and the context changes. 
and obviously the architects change and they come in with their sort of stylistic predispositions or whatever way. And it struck me as interesting how some of the centers are very recognizably that architect, that you can instantly tell that it's one of their buildings. Whereas others are very, that you wouldn't know if you didn't know. Someone like, I would say like Foster's one, for example, you wouldn't know that was a Foster's building unless somebody told you really, unless you knew a lot about the way he works. Whereas someone like the Gary building, like that's much more well, I think, distinguishing. Yeah, I think if you're an architect, you'd probably know, but the general public have never heard of Rem Cool House or, so they come in and they don't, they're not talking about, you know, God, what an amazing architect. <laughs> they're just talking about how the building feels. And, um, you know, the same with, with um, Zaha's building. And I think that's actually rather, um, rather, rather beautiful. And, 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 and I suppose that's also part of the characteristic that we are, we've asked each of our architects or, or before considering each of our architects is, you know, where is their ego in this? Um, it's, it's not about, um, it's not about creating a signature building. I mean, it is about creating a building that says um, that if you've got cancer, it's you know it you matter. Um, if you've got cancer, it's okay to ask for help. Um, um, so we 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 don't want the buildings to be um, shy and retiring in order to sort of kind of hide the cancer diagnosis or hide the distress or anxiety that people are facing. Um, but at the same time, we're not a, it's not a showcase for what um, the architect can do in its, in its sense. And so the ego and, and also the experience of the architect needs to be, you know, be quite mature in order to be able to really interrogate the, the, the brief. And so I think it's a compliment to Norman that um, you're not identifying immediately the Norman Foster building, but actually you're identifying it as a building that is um, beautiful and uplifting and um, that people are just drawn to be in. Mm. Um, well, I think you, you occupy a very small club of clients who have commissioned buildings from a large number of often well-known architects. That includes um, Vitra House, the furniture manufacturer in south of, um, south of Germany, and uh, probably the Serpentine Gallery as well. As of other similar clients that have experienced basically the same commission going out for a number of different architects. So your sort of experience from the client side is ex extremely unique in that respect. Mm. So have you found different architects easier or harder to work with? And have, have certain architects done things particularly well that you think others could learn from? I, I think, um, you know, working with architects is no different from working with um, you know your colleagues. You, you know they they all have their own particular methodology and style and and way of relating. Um, I I, th I think the role of being a client is a really interesting one, and I think you know we've been really lucky at Maggie's that um, that, that well a I feel very privileged. I've had the opportunity to work with so many different architects. But I think one of the things that has helped is that uh, we have been the consistent client. Um, and it's myself and Marsha Blakenham who um, still works as a client um, um, with with me, um, and we're we're cons we've been consistent with as a client on all twenty four. But we're also the client from the start of the project to um, the point of choosing the the. the the crockery and um, and the rugs and where the art goes, and I think I think my kind of if I said you know the, the, I think the difficulty for other people who are are commissioning buildings is often they only get one shot at it, and um, I think we could do a better job of educating how to be an effective client because I, th I think the robust relationship between a I mean when I say robust I mean it can be a, a beautiful relationship not a conflicting relationship but a but a one where um, the architect can really listen to the client but also the client is truly open to what the architect's got to bring in terms of solutions to the problem rather than the client being fixed um, in their ideology of what they think the building should be and look like, um, and in a way, you know, we've said things in our our brief 
um, um, to have no signs on the toilet, um, uh, not to have a reception um, uh, desk. That, that's not to say that we aren't mindful of how people walk into the building, how they're received, um, that they're given a place to pause and gather themselves before being greeted by a member of staff. But is there another way of solving this problem that makes people feel that they're being processed or that puts a layer between who the person's come in and needs to speak to and and um, uh, by this sort of receptionist sort of figure? So I, I think architects have got a kind of brilliant role in our society to help help solve some of the, 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 the ways within which um, people are processed through our kind of institutions or, or offices or our, our streets rather than be instructed by clients who just want more of what they already know. And, and, I, and I, I can say that because I was one of those. Um, and I've had to sort of learn through, um, through Maggie herself identifying that architecture was important. Um, but I also had to learn because I didn't think architecture really mattered. I, you know, I, I was brought up in the hospital institution. I didn't think the environment was relevant. I thought it was all about um, the, the professional clinical expertise, and that was the only thing that really counted. Um, until I became the first employee of the, the first centre, and the same patients that I'd been looking after for. Um, uh, couple of years in the chemotherapy suite came to visit me in, in, in my, my new place of work in Maggie's and who started telling me about things that they were worrying about and facing that they'd never told me before. And I had no new skills. I had no new capabilities at that point. Um, it, was, it was the building. It was the building that gave them the, the sense of this is your place where you can be yourself, where you can share your innermost fears and not it's not under the ownership and jurisdiction of the of the hospital that so it, so it was a real learning curve for me about um so I kind of got distracted on your <laughs> question about the client, but um and and I think you asked me about um, <laughs> conflict with it, with architects, but um yeah, it's not it's not always been easy. And I I think um you know, Rem is a you know he works really fast. So you know he he interrogated the brief, came up with a solution, and by God, he got it right instantly. Um, but I think one of the other things about um, being a client is that, that 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 may be how Rem works. But actually, on the whole, um, most architects need time, and um, and we had the privilege at Maggie's of having. We are able to give our architects the time to really um, develop the right kind of response to the to the brief. Um, but I think in again in most cases people are in a hurry to get their buildings mm -hmm. done, and often don't allocate enough time to 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 to, to the vision of of what might be possible. And I think people t get too early caught up in cost. Um, Cost matters. I, I I don't deny that, and you know our architects are given a, um, are, you know are given a budget, but if you if you curtail the vision too early on, um, you don't then work out how to get to that vision with your budget that you've got allocated. You're you're designing to the budget, which can I think also lose opportunities. Hmm. Well, I suppose you don't have the sort of commercial pressures that most clients probably would have. And we should say as well that all of the money is is raised out of fundraising, isn't it, for these buildings? And it's like that can't be a small challenge to raise money to build an entire centre yeah. and multiple centres. Well, that, that's that's that, that's where it, what gives us the time is raising the money. But we've also got you know a huge responsibility. It's it's not um, it's not Maggie's money. It's the general public's money that they've entrusted um, for us. So we've got to make sure that. Um, that we deliver the best that we possibly can with that, and and I, I think the other part of our role as a client is also we want buildings. I think you were sort of touching on that in your earlier question of we want buildings that um, aren't just you know fashion statements or signature statements. We want buildings that 
get better as they get older, um, that they mature into being um, a magnificent um, building as opposed to something that deteriorates, that looks good just you know for those first few years and then it's no longer in context or, or, um, or, or starts to deteriorate in terms of its um, quality and its feel. And I think that longer term lens also means that you get a, um, I don't know what the, what the right term is, but a more grown up building or, or a more a building with a more sense of itself, um, who knows itself and who, who um, I'm, I'm talking about the building as a, as a person, but I think we all know great architecture and when you see it 50 years on, it's still great. Um, um, and we all know architecture that, and you know, in the blink of the eye, oh, that's fun or it's interesting, but it sort of doesn't stay with you. Um, mm. Well, so have you on that point? You've well, the earliest centres have been around for what twenty years now, yeah. so you must be able to start to see those kind of things. Of the certain centres must be doing better or well in terms of their weathering and their maturation over time. Um, yes, and um, and and actually, you can see some of our decisions that we perhaps you know we we made well intentioned because of you know budget and fundraising challenges and wanting to be in a hurry to deliver the building that we perhaps didn't invest in the right quality of, of material at the at the at the time but on the whole um, um so the edinburgh center's um 25 years old has just had an extension because of um, the need for a more physical space, um, but it, it still feels. I mean, the extension in a way was fitting in with the original building, and it still it felt right then, and it still feels right now. If you go to um, again Richard Rogers' one here, um, which is just over ten years old, it's so much more wonderful than it was when we opened it. There's something, there's something about a, a building when it just. Um, as it's aging, that it, that it that it becomes even more beautiful, um, and I, I don't. Um, and again, that's where you have to sort of a ask that of your architect, but also have confidence in your architect that you're, you're looking for that longevity. Mm. Um, have you had to repaint the Richard Rogers one yet? No, 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 no. And okay. the floor and the concrete is still the, um, the upstairs is still the carpet that we had over ten years ago. Um, we're good with our cleaning, um, <laughs> but it, it's still still beautiful, um, and and that's because of the investment in in the in the, in the materials at, at the time. Um, I mean, we've 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 made some mistakes. You know, Zaha's building, the toilet was on the entrance, and it was a full length window, and it was clear glass, and <laughs> <You're> right, <laughs> and, uh, and even and even when we changed it to to um, opaque glass. You can still see the shadow of the individual on the toilet, you know. So, so we've made some mistakes, but you go into Zaha's building and it, and it, and it feels you know, wonderful. Mm. Well, like you said earlier, you've got that chance to sort of iterate because as a client doing effectively the same brief, mm. you can get better and better over time. So presumably you're getting better at commissioning things and getting better at spotting mistakes that might cause problems later down the line earlier yeah. on in the process. Because I think one of the things that people really worried about from a sort of um, a, a professional working perspective was that quite a lot of our, you know, about about um, sixty percent of our building is sort of open and uh, open plan in nature, um, and and again this is where, you know, um, the architect has to you know be strong is that the the health professional. Doesn't like that. They they worry about seeing someone on an open plan basis. They worry about giving people privacy. Um, they worry about um, um, being able to, in a sense, be in charge um, of the relationship and and the environment of the consulting room and the door and the corridor, in in a sense, and um, supports that. Um, whereas we're having very difficult conversations. Sometimes it's the first time someone's walked in and in an open plan pocket that's got a view to the kitchen, which might have a crowd sitting, chatting and laughing. Um, but we've never had a criticism about people not feeling that they weren't given the 
the, the privacy that they that they needed, and and again that's something to do. But but at the same time, they were able to have a more open conversation because they, they their anxiety wasn't raised by being led into a room and the door being shut. So there's a real cleverness to the fact that you can still um, change your working environment um, and have a better outcome in terms of building relationships with people than what you as a, as a professional would imagine is the right thing to do. Um, the right thing is always to take someone into a kind of closed door and, you know, um, mm. now you can cry and let's talk about how you're feeling. Um, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't lead to the same outcome and uh, and I think that's been a really interesting and surprising aspect of Maggie's and you can see how um, um, Ivan Harbour um, um, went on to lead the um, Guy's Cancer Centre and how he had to work very hard to bring the, the hospital teams down to the Maggie Centre to encourage them that there was another way of greeting their patients in the Cancer Centre, there was another way of um, creating that waiting environment that wasn't the, the one that they all knew and were familiar with. Mm. Well the centres are in so many ways the antithesis of classic hospital design aren't they? Especially sort of the hospital design that we've been left with over from the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, so have you, you, you touch on sort of trying to persuade people from the main hospital to come down and be inspired. Have you actually seen differences in outcomes from patients who have spent time in Maggie centres versus ones who haven't? Has there been that kind of study? We haven't done a, a randomised um, sort of study of there's a cohort mm -hmm. not coming to Maggie's and there's not. I mean there's a lot of um, evidence just you know with ourselves in terms of how people feel about our buildings, how people um, respond to our programmes, how it impacts on, on sort of quality of life and um, and how the, the the environment itself allows for that therapeutic work to go on, um, but no, a randomised study hasn't hasn't happened. But I I, th I I think we hope to also. So I, I think it's okay for hospitals to not be a Maggie centre because in a way their purpose is different. You know they are institutions of delivering, um, you know, technical excellence. Um, but I, I, I think enough thought doesn't go into well, what do we want to communicate to, um, to, to the to the to the patient that um, in a way supports the work as opposed to, um, um, and makes people feel safe and confident about the work that's going on as opposed to it, it is just a series of functional kind of spaces and um, and God we've got an opportunity going forward if if we are about to build. 14 new hospitals, as the government has outlined, to to not just throw up some new hospitals, but actually throw up some spaces that can support the social um, well-being um, um, and mental health of our patients alongside the the, the, the delivery of mm. technical excellent efficiency um, and treatment. Yeah, well, there's so much evidence about the effects of, sort of environment on um, outcomes and medical outcomes. Um, there's loads and loads of studies about it. Um, so I guess your challenge is to bring as many ministers and people involved in hospital <laughs> building into Maggie's centres and try and persuade them not to commission more sort of boxy corridor-led um, Well, it might, it might be more uh, working with the estates directors of, of our hospitals. And, and we, we naturally... Um, with our hospitals go to hospital specialist um, architects um, and you know I'm not saying they don't have a role um, but I think you miss the opportunity by not um, um, employing an architect who is who is thinking about more than just the, the, the technical efficiencies of the of the building and actually can bring something um, new to what our hospitals could and should be, and you see it a bit in um, the charity called Horatio Gardens, who um, brought are bringing gardens to spinal units, and um, you know how to create a space where actually not just the, the the patient, the family can enjoy outdoors when they're spending you know long periods of 
of being hospitalised, but also the health professional staff can enjoy and, and during this time of I really like to mention COVID, um, you know, outdoor spaces have become so meaningful for people and yet um, our hospitals don't invest in in how, how outdoor spaces can actually be part of um, enhancing the, 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 the treatment and experience for people. Mm. And you're also now expanding outside of the UK. I noticed from your list. How's how's that been going as a process, and does that present any unique challenges or cultural differences or anything like that, or systemic differences? Well, I think it's yeah. So it's been really interesting. So our first centre that we did overseas was in um, in Hong Kong, in uh, in the Tumen territories, which is slightly outside the the, the um, uh, main part of the city. Um, and then we have one in Tokyo and one in Barcelona. Um, so in terms of our architects, you know, Hong Kong is Frank Gehry and, and our Barcelona centre is Benedetta Tabuli and it's the most beautiful um, building, extraordinary women. Um, and, um, yeah, they're, you know, they're basically the same. And I think what's, what's interesting is that as a, we often want to layer assumptions on um, different cultures and what different cultures sort of need and and, and, and in particular when we were developing the centre in Tokyo um, you know there isn't a culture of charity and not-for-profit and um, there isn't a culture of um, of anything else outside the sort of kind of hospital per se and um, and a feeling that, that of privacy and not talking and not sharing um, but in fact, what the Tokyo Centre found is that, um, and 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 the Masako who runs it is a cancer nurse, um, is you know it's very clear they're just the same as um, cancer folks in America or in Scotland or in um, in in Swansea. Um, they they are still hurting. They still feel uh, anxious and worried. They're still experiencing distress um, and still need and benefit from support um, so why why make the assumption that because culturally people assume that that they aren't a, a, a talking sharing um, that they, they don't need something like a Maggie Centre to provide that that work from and um, the centre has been proven to be you know very successful um, and they're in a temporary site at the moment, so they're looking for a permanent building. So they're working on that now as our next phase. Okay. And do you involve the patients in the sort of design process? Do the architects generally speak to them and talk to them about how the centres are used and how they feel about certain parts of it or other parts? Yeah, so um, so, so people may, may have a view about this, but um, we, we, we don't design our buildings by committee. And that doesn't mean to say that we don't value or respect or aren't interested in anyone's views um, who views the centre um, of what's needed. And we do often sort of ask people what um, what they think of what we're doing and, and what could we do better. Um, but I think what happens within a sort of, if you create a committee base and you have your patient representative on your committee base, then I think you get a... Um, a reduced outcome of what that building can 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 achieve because you're trying to satisfy all of the committee members' sort of perspectives and views. And again, that's where I come back to the point of you have to entrust this to the architect. And I wish more clients said that. <laughs> and 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 so yes, our architects um, will spend time visiting our centres, sitting at the kitchen table, um, talking to people, observing how people. Um, arrive, sit, um, um, be. I mean, when we were working on the um, um, uh, Norman's building, um, 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 uh, David, um, who's uh, well, in charge of sort of design at Fosters, um, you know, obsessed about um, heat, seat, seat heights and the democracy of of seat heights, because again, if you go to a hospital environment, the doctor's on the swing chair, you know, he's in control, he can swivel away from you, you can lean back. Um, you're perched on the plastic chair, which is usually a, a more subservient height. 
um, you know, how do you create a, a way of creating an environment where you've got the low tier and the high tier based on different um, ages and comfort levels, but yet you can also move something to make someone comfortable. So, so David, David was obsessed with, with tier heights and how they would all flow and work together. But if, if you just had one patient on the, you know, they just have their perspective and their views. You, you've got to give it to the architect and um, and entrust them to go in and as I said, investigate the problem and uh, investigate the solution. And that requires talking to a lot of people, absorb, observing that, and then having confidence in in in, in their in, in their you know approach to solving those problems. Mm. So, Designing by committee, in my, my perspective, is a disaster to um, best building outcome. Yeah, well, like I say, I wish uh, more clients uh, had your perspective in that respect. Um, how do you decide on exactly where to build them? Is it the hospitals approach you and ask you, or do you sort of um, pitch to hospitals and say, here's a gap, wait, and maybe we could have one here? I think we've done everything uh, over time, but primarily, um, well, we're a relationship sort of um, uh, organisation, so it's about relationships. Um, so we're on hospitals where um, where the hospital has seen a value for a Maggie Centre and wants to help make a centre possible, um, because it's it's not an it, it's not an easy thing for a hospital to do. Uh, and when I say that, it's because they're busy, and so you're asking them to give up some time to work out. Um, which bit of land that you can have that won't be part of their future development needs, or um, um, you know, um, you know, if, we, if we're taking away two or three car parking spaces, you know, it requires a year of negotiations as to how we can make that possible. So they really have to want it to go through some of the difficulties that they face, um, and 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 then also we're, we're primarily based on hospitals that are designated as cancer centres, so that we. We know that the majority of people with cancer will come through that hospital um, for a proportion or a large proportion or all of their cancer treatment and so that we've got the best chance of um, supporting people during the treatment and then be a place that people can come to when treatment's um, sort of finished. And um, But it's relationships and like all things you can make, you can be more successful when, when people all want to make, make it happen. Um, and Maggie's have evolved in the sense that I think people have, you know, come to recognise the value of what our centres have to offer. Because quite a lot of people wonder why aren't we in the hospital? Why do we have to have our own building on the hospital grounds? Um, and it is it is something about our work, which is about it's 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 the personless cancer in their family's place. It, it's not the the, the professional place, so we have to have our front door. Um, the association that comes with seeing your doctor, uh, the, the, the smell of the, the hospital when you're coming in each week for your chemotherapy, um, that is not the right environment to come back to, to talk to the psycholo psychologist about um, the existential crisis that you're facing around, you know, what's the purpose of my life? Um, I, I know I'm going to die of cancer. How do I, um, how do I face living um, in the knowledge of that? The hospital environment's not the right place for, for, for those things. So I think our own front door, our own smell, <laughs> um, and also we're free from having to have pastel pink and <laughs> PVC chairs. So there's lots of benefits to our own front door. Yeah, well, it is that. So it's that horrific sort of strip lighting, white and sort of mint blue, vinyl floors. And there are practical reasons for some some of these things, I guess. And it's a very different typology to talk about a, sort of the interior of, an, of the actual hospital than, um, I guess, a branch of the hospital that exists in its sort of own oasis. Mm. So it's, well, I don't want to be too unfair on hospitals and say that they, they why aren't they more like Maggie Centres? But you could very easily make some changes to the way the interior of hospitals were designed that would replicate a lot of the effects that I guess your centres have. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not beyond um, you know, the extraordinary body of architects that we that we have here in the UK to to solve some of those patient experiences problems. Um, uh, I mean Alex de Reich, who worked in um, our Oldham centre, um, again a sort of derelict 
ugly sight, um, challenging sight. Um, um, he at the time was learning firsthand about the impact of cancer and, and he's, he's talked about it um, and his partner was, was going through um, cancer and I mean he saw firsthand the, the, the institutional sort of processing and we know that Alex is obsessed by wood um, but also he, he recognised that his partner, um, her, her, her neuropathy was being affected by a chemotherapy, the sensitivity to cold and touch. Um, actually, you do have to think about what people are are, 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 are touching and experiencing, and because it has a, you know, it has a neurological impact that 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 that, that does something to you, and um, both negatively and positively. Um, so, I, I think they could be transformed, but the fear is, I think, is also that they won't then do their clinical efficient job, or they will cost more. Um, but I, but we look at that in such a narrow, assumptive lens rather than think about how can we get all of those things and still manage it within our budget mm. or, or some of those things. Well, this is why I think the evidence base is so crucial because if you can show um, objectively and empirically that X design of environment has X output of mm. better than the, other, the previous environment, then you can sort of metricize and monetize that and say, oh, that's going to save you this amount of money over that amount of time. Therefore, it is worth you spending a bit more money on design up front because it will save you money down the line. Yeah. But I guess that's the evidence that's sort of, well, there is a lot, but largely lacking at the moment. Maybe your centers can help provide some of that. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, again, in a way, the centers, you know, you, you, could, you, you could sign up for 12 sessions with a psychologist. But actually, you might find you only need um, three sessions to psychologists because you've got a bit of peer support at the kitchen table. Um, there's a relaxation group happening in the other room that you can join in to help, you know, develop your own techniques that you can use for yourself. And so all of a sudden, you find that sense of that you're learning new skills, uh, but you're not, but you're not having to have it in a sort of linear way. And I think that's often how we. We package things as well. Um, so the movement at the moment around um, looking at social care, um, looking at integrating acute and social care together, um, you know, is a really exciting opportunity to um, incorporate um, health and well-being as well as the treating of the disease, um, and 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 um, and actually start to to. To, to, to do something that isn't just saying we're delivering holistic care, but actually is is truly delivering what that should be. Mm. What well, do you think other other organisations and other that represent other conditions other than cancer um, or other even not perhaps more medical, let's like say social care kind of um, centres or organisations could could they learn from what you've done and replicate it in a hybridised or adjusted way? Do you think there's sort of an, any obvious openings where you could do that sort of thing? Yeah, so um, so so Maggie's, we've had um, um, lots of people come and sort of visit and learn from us uh, as much to, um, you know, how do you let um, when we, when young women are coming out of prison reintegrate and socialise and make a sort of transition in an environment that actually again is rather than um, rather than diminishing um, the individual actually can enhance their possibilities and, and capabilities for a future life. Um, so I think in that kind of post-prison sector we've, we've had a, a lot of um, interest. Um, we th There's a charity called Independent Age which again is trying to embody um, how you can infiltrate sort of youth centres but also create spaces for older people and, and how you can create that sort of mix. Um, and, and we've seen some examples in the hospital in the Glasgow Centre, there's a there's a family space which when you walk into it feels almost like a Maggie Centre. Unfortunately you have to have a code pass to get into it and you've, you've got to go through some rules but when you get in it is a kitchen table and a sitting room and a space and and some views. So I think I think there are there are lots of opportunities that are being led by sort of individual initiatives. Um, I think back to the kind of comment about hospitals. I, th I think we do need a 
a sort of design led solution approach that is a that's bought into by a sort of kind of government level and fostered and encouraged. Um, but maybe not. Maybe we have to just ourselves go about making the changes that we can and then hopefully they will sort of build up to to create a sort of tipping point and maybe you need both. <laughs> um, yeah, well has anyone ever come to you like another organisation saying like we're trying to do something similar to what you're doing? How can you help us kind of thing? Yeah, so lo lots of sort of um, uh, um, startups, there's a, a centre um, being developed for um, uh, people who, who have um, sort of neurological strokes um, and um, and another centre that's being developed for um, families with dementia, um, and, and it's 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 very much about actually how can how can folks who are going through dementia still not just go to a a, a community centre and then sit in a circle? Actually, how can they still be active and you know be cooking and 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 um, exchanging and and creating? And also to support the sort of families who don't have anywhere to go and often have to give up their jobs and their their, their social life and who can feel very alone. So yes, yeah, so lot, lots of people um, coming to sort of learn from us. And so I think that I think there's a growing interest in in the aspect of how how the built environment can enhance the work that goes on inside it. Mm. Well, on, on the sort of elderly side of things, I've noticed there's been an increase in sort of elderly specific housing that's been commissioned as well, especially from architects as well, and often some really good outcomes. I always thought this about arms houses, like we had arms houses for hundreds of years. Why did we suddenly unlearn that arms mm. houses are actually quite a good idea? And they sort of provide an environment for people that's really uplifting as well as just providing good space, good well-designed space for people. Um, I guess in, in the old days it was sort of poorer people rather than just people with medical conditions. Um, but in a way you're sort of providing that, but in a kind of commercial social building kind of sense. And you're, you're, you must be able to, you sort of draw this fine line between it is a commercial building kind of, but it's also, it's designed not to look like one. And it's just, I found it interesting reading about the way your um, receptions work about how not, you don't have a reception desk, you don't have any signs or anything apart from like a Maggie sign or whatever. Um, and there's sort of a different social interplay when you come in for the first time. You come in because normally you come into a building and you sort of have permission to go up to the reception desk and say, oh, I'm here for so-and-so or whatever. But in a Maggie's you don't have that. And you say, is it that someone comes over who's working there and greets you and then directs you that way? And how does that change the way people interact in their sort of first encounters with the building? Yeah, so what, what our architects have, have created um, for us is a way of um, the health professional physic. So they've changed physically how how the the, the person arriving and, and everyone arriving for the first time gives it away a mile off. You know, your body language tells you you're new. Um, <laughs> and um, so the staff are trained, you know, to, to observe and pick that up. Or that someone's returning and is actually you know, in an, in an uncomfortable sort of space. Um, but what, what, by taking away the reception desk, the, the, the language of the greeting is, is by a, a professional, and in our case, you know, a very experienced cancer nurse, um, um, being alongside you. And it, it just changes the dynamic in the relationship because it's not a... Um, how can I help you? You know, it's 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 the alongsideness that actually keeps the relationship equal, and um, and then there's there's movement. So uh, in in most cases, the first visit would be you know movement towards the kettle, um, which allows for and and it's so trite. You know, you're smiling. <laughs> Typical um, British. <laughs> yeah, but you know, and, and we keep getting. That's one thing that does has been cropping up is putting in the automatic hot water kind of uh, dispenser, and and I'm not quite sure how to respond to that because the beauty of the kettle is it takes a bit of time to boil, and whilst it's boiling, you know, you're having a trivial conversation in a sense about do you want tea or coffee, but it's it's men, it's purposeful, it's it's allowing you to just 
and you can see people's shoulders just starting to decompress, just starting to observe their environment. I was waiting for the kettle to, you know, to say, mm, I, mm. this is okay. This is, um, I, I can kind of see where I am. Oh, a bit of art and all, I'm not sure about that, but it's interesting. And and then before you know it, you're then going somewhere to sit with your kettle and you've, you've sort of formed a, um, a sense of connection. So, I mean, again, we've got the luxury of time, but I would also argue that if you use that 10 minutes really effectively, you can get to the nub of the issue much more quickly mm. than if you, you you build in barriers when people then, they're, they're, they're anxious, they're, 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 their anger is building, their regret. And then when people do that, they become assertive, they can become difficult, they sound awkward, and they can then be irritating to the person who's trying to sort of support and help them. So all of this actually helps make that connection and the job um, more, the job that we're trying to do more effective. And, and so the architects, by taking away the reception desk and giving us a different way of moving people, and as I say, not taking them to a closed door, um, or that if, and again, we use a lot of sliding doors uh, um, or mechanisms so that, you know, so people can see what's going on into a room and um, and if they're, if they're taken into that room, the door just stays open. So again, I mean, that whole thing of you can leave, mm. <laughs> you're not being imprisoned. Um, I guess that also help. gives you permission to sort of be overheard by other people who might be hanging around on the kitchen table yeah. in the middle. But you're not nervous that you have to have complete privacy the mm. whole time like like you said earlier you would in a hospital and you're not alone you can hear a little bit of the murmurings and and, and we know that a, a person going into hospital um you know only retain you know, 20 30 percent of what they hear from the consultation process because of anxiety um you know part of our job is to help give people sort of tools and techniques to 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 hear what the, the professionals saying but actually wouldn't that be a wonderful opportunity if you could change that um that way of being that actually people would retain more and if people retain more they'd feel more um certain of what they've been told they wouldn't worry that they were they were missing bits of the information they wouldn't then make a demand to come back and see the doctor or nurse so you manage your time differently so you so those efficiencies if you like are seen somewhere else rather than mm. in the moment. So I think that, but that physical alongsideness um, and treating in a way our patients as equal partners in in the care is easy to say, but you actually have to change the methodology that you adopt as a professional. So so when people come and work in Maggie's um, who've worked in the hospital institution. I mean, the first year they find it really difficult. They feel really uncomfortable. They're they're completely on show all the time. There's nowhere where they can go and really hide. Um, um, there's no corridors where they can shut the door and say, you know, patient's barred. There's th there's no opportunity to go and bitch about your colleague or <laughs> that irritating patient that you just kind of. It, in a way, it changes. The behavior of the staff too mm. um so they find it uncomfortable that that being exposed but after a while they realize that actually they it, it, they change and and recognize that actually their their behaviors themselves have improved and their quality of professional life has improved because there's a consistency to the to the to the way of working and the way of treating people mm. How much of the of the services that a cancer patient gets have you managed to decant out of the main hospital into the Maggie Centre? Because obviously there's practical difficulties around that you wouldn't start putting scanning equipment or anything in there. But I guess in terms of the talking therapies and the sort of the emotional support kind of things, how much of that still goes on in the actual hospital, and how much is that sort of put in Maggie's, or is Maggie's more of like a hangout space where sort of the the supporting um, therapies happen? Yeah, so, so I think this, the, in a way, the, so a Maggie Centre when it's fully operational, <coughs> and um, and it, it will take it about um, four to five years to get to that sort of point, is seeing about sixty percent of the new cancer population that is coming through the cancer centre, 
and on average a person will come back for sort of six visits um, so we're, we're not for everyone and not everyone needs what, what Maggie Centres um, does but in essence I think Maggie's picks up the the person who isn't presenting as if they obviously need support so the hospitals are fine at picking up the the, the difficult aggressive or the the person who is you know showing you know very um you, you know deep signs of psychological distress but it's the sort of bandwidth in the middle that um so we have a sort of um um you know people perform for their for their health professional put on their best outfit they put on their lipstick they put on their best face um so often the 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 sense of worry and concern loneliness that they might be facing because they live on their own and their their peer group have died because they're of a certain age and um and they don't fall into the category of being the young mum who everyone kind of automatically assumes that um you know because we can relate to them as a, a sort of in a way needs extra help so I think that group often, that, that faceless group often get missed within the, it's not that they mean to miss them, it's just, um, um, and it's that group that tends to find its way into to Maggie's to get that additional bit of support. Mm. Yeah, I guess it's, it's difficult to know sort of who, who needs the support in the first place. So how, how do you make people aware of Maggie's and, and sort of say, and sell the value of it to them? When they're sort so, of going so it's health, health professionals actually training and educating them, and um, who are brilliant and amazing advocates, which is why you know you want the hospital the cancer centre to want you, and then and then sort of fellow patients. But it's also about um, about changing the narrative about what people can do to help themselves, and when people change that narrative, they 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 feel more in control and more confident about facing sort of daily life so it's not about um I, and and i think you know that narrative if you like of changing that approach can be can be applied to many health conditions um uh, chronic conditions that people have to live with um with ongoing uncertainty i mean we just happen to and our staff happen to specialize in the field of cancer but it's as, as applicable to um to the society of multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or um, or people with stroke or you know um, um, so there's many areas I think that would benefit from the kind of the methodology that Maggie's have sort of developed for the cancer mm. population. Have you found like most hospital campuses are uh, you know on the edge of cities or sort of semi-rural so they've probably got a reasonable amount of space around them to build the centre have you had any ish, any problems or issues with the more urban related centres in terms of getting the same value when you're more constrained on a sort of site basis? Yeah, so I think um, I think most hospitals campuses are an absolute nightmare, um, partly because um, uh, you know because of you know they've evolved over years, so they've thrown up different bits of their. Um, institution and so it can be sporadic and random and uh, and incoherent and and then the dominance of the car park uh, means that you know that can be your main view that you get um uh, sort of from the hospital um i think what i think most architects have responded and love the um tight difficult space than the kind of more open um, so you know, we gave Thomas Heatherwick, you know, a horrific site, horrific. Um, it was horrific on all fronts. It was the last bit of patch of grass, and it literally was a patch of grass um, that was on a quite a steep hill, um, built beside a multi-story car park, um, beside a sort of wind tunnel entrance to um, a new cancer centre that had just um, been built. And um, it did have extraordinary views out over a car park and beyond it to uh, um, a sort of landscape. And um, you know, Thomas was really nervous about just taking away this 
this patch of grass, but the patch of grass, it wasn't something you could sit on or enjoy. It was just, they, they just, that's what they did over the rubble from the, um, and what he did was created, um, you know, an extraordinary three layered level of building with, with more garden, but with, with garden spaces that people could actually sit in and enjoy. And it's, and again, isn't that, you know, that's what the inventiveness of, there was no garden for people to sit in before, mm. um, but now there's a building that's working and delivering care. But but there's also a, a garden that people can be in. Um, yeah, well, the Heatherwick one definitely seems on the face of it the most sort of vegetated <laughs> of, all of, the, of all of them. Well, he likes his um, gardens on the roof. Is, yeah, uh, yeah, his is definitely a signature sort of Heatherwick building. You can tell with the um, the sort of the faceted curves going around the corners and the. The semi vaulting, it looks very much like um, like the Garden Bridge proposal, for example. It's yeah. a similar aesthetic. Well, you're sort of probably working on that design at the same time, but it's the right response for the for the site and and um, and, and the right solution in terms of what it sort of um, generated. Um, where, whereas you know Alex's building in Oldham was, as I say, was, you know also very grim and you know his garden has had to sort of go under the underbelly of the of, of the building and you know not easy to achieve and has got a beautiful view over to um oldham football club mm. i read in the brief that you don't employ full-time gardeners so for something where the garden is so much a value of the brief and adds so much value to the sort of psychological side of it um have you found that hospitals have been nervous about having so much Sort of extra garden space in terms of maintenance, and has that become something that you have to? Yeah, so we've got we've got a few gardens that extend beyond our um, lease site, um, of which um, um, the condition is, is that we look after it from the hospital, and, and that's why they let us. Um, so in in Dundee and Frank's building, we've got an amazing kind of, sort of land form that Arabella Lennox Boyd sort of designed for us, and. Um, which also gives amazing views from the Ninewell Hospital sort of down. Um, but we wouldn't have been able to create this and this labyrinth actually that people use as a sort of walking meditative um, exercise space. Um, we wouldn't have got that if we didn't say to the hospital that we would not only do the work and the designs, but we would look after the maintenance. We, we do employ a, a gardener for each centre, so, um, but, but it's part time. And, you know, we do ask and we learn through mistakes. So, you know, Frank's, Gary's building was our third building. And in order to change the light bulbs, we had to put scaffolding up to do that. So I think it is in the brief of, could you just... I noticed you mentioned yeah, that. Could, could you just sort of... Uh, but in, in a way, you know, we, we ha you have to tend to the practical things. And, you know, if our staff can't change the light bulb and we have to get a, you know, th that means that... Um, you know, you need another layer of working. So yeah, we do. So we learned to ask for that, <laughs> um, and actually, you know, and the whole that res responds to. Um, the other thing that we learned through gardens is that gardens just being maintained by volunteers um, m means that things get cut or um, or removed that were actually part of the <laughs> original design. So by having a a gardener who actually um, so Rosie's our gardener who at West London, she has dialogue with Dan, because things die in gardens, things need replenished or just don't quite work. And so you have to have the dialogue. It's, it's, it's sort of different, it's a different relationship than, uh, than the one with the, that you have with the architect in the building and um, going forward. And then the volunteers can then work with the gardener to make sure that they're, that they're looking after the, <laughs> the garden and they're not digging up bulbs thinking they're onions um, mm. which hospital estates gardens <laughs> oh, I, I have i warn you not i i that's exactly um a, a real story <laughs> yeah that's true i guess well i've, I've always thought it's like, there's a one of the old victorian style hospitals near me um the, the basingstoke one um which got converted into houses years ago I always thought the way that was laid out with the sort of long wings with only two, two or at most three stories mm. that provided so much opportunity for having gardens around, but then obviously had practical problems in terms of patient transport and proximity and that kind of thing. Um, so you're 
which ones are you working on at the moment now? Which are, which is going to be the next one to open? So, um, so we're very fortunate that we've got um, Amanda Levitt's um, centre in Southampton, and I think we are getting the keys at the end of October. Um, well, the furniture's arriving on the twenty eighth of October, so uh, um, um, we're assuming it's it's going to be um, finished by then. Um, and it's um, so, uh, so Amanda has created a a sort of um, a contemporary building within a, um, a a building within a contemporary new forest garden. So um, we don't we don't want everyone to think that where's the new forest garden is, but it's a version of that that Sarah Price, who's the landscape designer, who's worked on it. Um, and again, it's a building that is um, in a a sea of landscape um, at the rear of the hospital. Um, um, so yeah, so we're really excited about about that opening, and we had a sort of a bit of an unveiling of um, there's two sort of materials, and there's um, as you know Amanda likes working with ceramics, and um, so um, we had a beautiful family-run ceramic um, firm from Barcelona who who've done like ceramics, and it sort of blends with uh, a sort of mottled um, stainless steel. Um, um, so you'll get the mirroring effect of the garden as you're sort of walking um, sort of around it. So, so we just had a bit of a reveal of that. So getting a start to get a sense of what the building will will be like. So very exciting. Oh, yeah, that's good. You have attempted to commission a, a neoclassical Maggie Center or a um, some I don't know some historical style. <laughs> um, it's surprising. No, that hasn't um, that that hasn't happened. I mean, obviously, our most uh, challenging um, from a sort of planning permission perspective has been our Bart's Maggie Centre, which was um, built alongside the Grade 1 listed, um, um, oh my god, I've just forgotten the architect's uh, name, um, 1700s, I'll is come back to you. No, it's not Nash. Um, um, god, I've said it so many times. Anyway, so the reason why we asked Stephen Hall was, um, um, was again was an architect who is contemporary but but sensitive to building alongside um, 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 historic um, uh, buildings and, and has a lot of experience of sort of doing that and I I don't think you can just match or blend but but you but it still needs to be appropriate context and so we had. We got rejected for planning permission. Um, we we finally got it. That we then went into judiciary review. Um, we had to do a sort of mediated outcome. Um, you know, it was touch and go as whether or not we'd we'd, we'd find our way to uh, getting it done. And then, and then when it opened, the, the complainants, the people who were truly unhappy, said, "It's amazing. It's beautiful. If if only." If only you told us that this was what it was going to look like, and I was only like, but it's exactly, visualizations and but it's exactly and like the painting yeah. that Stephen Hall, because he 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 designs by water painting, mm. and uh, his first water painting is exactly what it looks like, and and I think, I think again, it was a real learning for me, a recognition that that, that we find change difficult, and and then when it comes to us, it feels like why. Why have it's always been there, or mm. and so how do we, how do we make progress um, without this barrier, this natural barrier that's there of the discomfort that change isn't um, 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 that, that that people have? How how can we kind of cut out that that space of time when people are are nervous and concerned? Mm. Well I, think, well, I think that's, for me, that's where things like virtual reality come in, in like the planning stage and making sure that you get people inside a VR headset, walking around, looking at the thing that they're opposing mm. and see, being able to see in sort of almost photorealistic terms, actually, it's not that bad. Like, this actually is nicer than the <laughs> rubbishy patch of grass or yeah. it's nicer than the, the old building that's there before. Yeah. And we have this um, within Stephen Hall's building. We have we 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 have a shared staircase between us and the Great Hall, and um, and you you can go through. Um, and um, and actually, what is amazing about the Great Hall is you've got all the benefactors of of the the day who gave money to build our Bart's Hospital, 
And again, that's uh, you know another example of the role of philanthropy and that that, that philanthropy led to you know, what was our first purpose-built working hospital. You know, it was if you take care of the workers, you know, they'll work better. But actually, it was about learning um, of um, the, the health of the nation. And but the contrast, then I mean, when people come back into um, Stephen's building of not feeling that they're opposed with each other, but they're they're a moment in time, and they still and they, and they work beautifully together, but are different. Yeah. Well, that's the power of architecture, isn't it? And that's that's what's so hard to sell to people because most people don't experience that, mm. and like you don't know that there is an alternative to a standard hospital aesthetic until you're inside a Maggie Center and you can see an alternative and people suddenly have like a moment of realization where they think, oh, actually, there's a better way of doing things, if only I'd known kind of thing. We did have a moment very early on with Maggie's on Frank Gehry's building where we had a, a donor who had committed to the capital costs and we were inexperienced and the building was going to cost double of what we had had said to the donor. And um, so we had this this lunch with the, the donor and Frank um, to see if we could, you know, find some common support for his uh, design and approach. Um, and again, there's the beauty of giving time. So, you know, Frank's got about 50 different models of his Maggie Centre and he's told the story himself of, you know, Maggie came to him in a dream and said, just tone it down, Frank, you know, it's too much. And actually his toned out building is, is just perfect. Um, but at this meeting, um, you know, she, she was wagging at him for you know, being you know, too fancy and costing too much. And and when his husband turned to her and said, well, where would we be if we if we if no one had built those beautiful churches that we can go and sit in and and have, you know, spaces to reflect and 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 wonder? Um, you know, our, our society would be so poor if, if if people hadn't been brave enough to, you know, to to, to um, invest in the quality of designs. That means our churches, you know, continue to to be here today. And uh, so that was the kind of winning statement that got Frank's <laughs> building approved, and we could progress. Um, mm. Well, I guess as a society, we invest in what we care about the most at any given time in history. Like back in when they were building the old cathedrals, it was the, the sort of belief in God and the fear of God and that kind of thing. And that's why they invested so much. And I think that if anything, so what's if equivalent? anything these yeah. days is something <laughs> worth caring about, it's looking after cancer mm. patients in the best mm. way possible. Um, so some, your organization is something that, in, in my opinion, absolutely deserves mm. the highest possible investment in, in architectural quality and, and care. But even now, you know, at the long length of time, we still have to... We, we still have to persuade and sometimes justify um, why just not throwing up a, a box um, isn't just the right thing to do. Um, and it's changing, but it's, it, but it's you know, it, it's, it's not gone away. Mm. So it's still something we need to continue to um, talk about and champion and um, and and to I mean in a way that's why our, our our doors were really open and welcome to people coming and visiting and seeing our buildings because um, it's, it's seeing them in action that will hopefully influence more people to take something away that might improve the environments or the buildings that they're working on yeah do you have to, presumably you don't only have to be a cancer patient to go and visit a Maggie Centre, is it open to friends and family as well? Oh yes, no, to... so it's very much friends and family and again that's why being our own building is really important because, um, well I mean if, again if you take the circumstances we're in at the moment, um, you know, relatives aren't allowed into the hospital, um, you know, relatives haven't spoken to a, a, a cancer professional now for, for six months. Um, so actually to be able to come into Maggie Centre and um, and to talk about that impact is is, is crucial. And um, there is much, um, we know that the person with cancer makes the best outcome by having great support around them through their family and, and friends. Um, and so how can you support that family and friends in that role? And then, and then also, you know, um, you know, we have 450 people a day died pre-COVID of cancer. You know, those families need support after they've lost someone um, 
to cancer too. So, so Maggie's are, are very much there for that post um, death care um, uh, uh, for the family, and it's it's a you know it's a challenge that's been sort of raised in the kind of height of COVID of don't forget about cancer. You know, this is how many people a day died before. We know we know that the number is going to go up for a period of time because of how cancer treatments have been altered, but. Um, it's a significant amount of people each day that are, you know, lose you know someone close to them who they love. Mm. And as an organisation, what are your biggest challenges moving forward in this sort of immediate future? Um, oh, um, funding's um, always a challenge. Um, um, I think it's going to be. Um, the funding challenge for new centres. So, you know, we've been approached for centres in places like Leicester and Preston and Bristol, who, you know, are are large cancer centres who have a you know a lot of people who would who would benefit from a centre. Um, so we may just have to take longer um, um, before we can um, see those centres sort of realised, and then it's. Um, and then the immediate challenge is that um, people with cancer have been hugely impacted because treatments were stopped or altered. Cancer screening was um, stopped and is barely up and up and running. So we've we've been seeing people who have lost someone that they love, who they weren't able to be with in some occasions. People who had their treatment stopped and have seen their disease progress uh, to the point where now treatment may not be an option and people who are presenting with um, um, delayed diagnosis so their 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 outcomes are, are altered as a result of not having access to the screening and diagnostics um, that they would have done in non-COVID times so there's a there's a real challenge for the next three to five years um, to get back to the survival rates of 2019 and so that level of Distress actually is is is, um, is is going to be around for for quite some time to come. Mm. Have you managed to keep the centres open during COVID? Yeah, so we kept all the centres um, open with a sort of um, a small team, and they all did different things based on what was right for their community. Some of them were places where people who were dying could come to the mega centre and be with their family because they weren't allowed into the hospital. Um, so we did very bespoke stuff that was um, was right and helpful. And then from the 1st of July or whatever the date was that we were allowed to sort of um, more formally work, um, our, 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 our centres have been fully open and, um, and, and, and operational. They're different um, because we haven't been able to create the the peer-to-peer -peer support and and obviously working with people on a more individual basis, um, but they're different. And one of the things that that people have told us is how important it is that they're that they're open and and working and that they can be seen. And I did have a moment of crisis of um, as we started with COVID of maybe our buildings don't matter, maybe we don't need them, everything can just be done virtually. Um, and but I think what has been clear is. Um, uh, um, being able to talk to your benefits advisor on the phone is one thing, but being able to actually come and talk to them in person about your debt worries, your um, immigration challenges, um, your family care um, sort of needs, um, as an example, um, is just so important. And um, also, although technology has helped support people and bridge the gap of face to face work. Um, the buildings and being able to provide face-to-face -face work is still essential and needed. So, so we need our buildings, and they're going to stay open and operational, and we, and we need to do more of them. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. I think you're, you're right that it's that the virtual stuff can only go so far. If anything, after all this is over, everyone will suddenly realise just how important the social side and the physical contact and all that kind of stuff actually is to sort of psychological health more than anything else. Yeah. Um, on the brief. Um, have you ever put it to either a competition or to students as a project? Because reading the brief, it struck me that it's such a unique but also intricate, simple but at the same time complex brief. 
it would be fascinating to see that as a student project and seeing how yeah, they respond. Yeah, we've had quite a lot of student projects at different architectural schools, different years, um, studying, mm -hmm. come up with ideas. I mean, we haven't gone down the um, competition route for um, um, for architects. Actually, it was because um, Piers Goff um, told myself and Marcia that it was only lazy clients that went down the route of competition and that the client's job was to get out there and to meet lots of architects, to see lots of their buildings, um, and then to choose the architect that they wanted to work with. So we've tried not, we've tried to follow in Pierce's <laughs> footsteps of not being a lazy client. Mm. Well, you, I've noticed you've chosen mostly large or medium-sized practices to do the, the buildings. I mean, let me know if there's any exceptions to that. But is there potential for opening it up to smaller practices or emerging practices? Yeah, so, um, uh, um, I mean, I think it's probably more to do with the maturity that has meant that, that perhaps the practice is more at that size. But um, um, uh, Dow and Jones, um, you know, Biba and Allen, they're a small practice and they've been We've just opened the Cardiff Centre um, um, that they've worked on. Um, Abe Rogers has just done our Morrison Centre. He's not. It depends what you classify as. Yeah. In architecture, I think is that anything well, more, I, over the, five starts to become yeah. large. Yeah. yeah. Anything yeah. Um, five or lower is probably small. Five to yeah. fifty. Yeah. I medium. mean, I think the thing with a Marathi Centre as well is, um, you know, and and. Uh, I think we ask a lot of our architect and and perhaps also hopefully because they enjoy it and it's um, um, working with us as a client um, I suppose it's 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 working with an architect who and we, we pay our architects because we recognize that you know most architects are, you know it's not a well-paid industry um, and um, and costs do need to be covered but we probably do ask architects to go over and beyond what the even um, um, payment schedule is that we, <laughs> that we, we do give that with them. all of our projects if we care about them though, which most yeah. architects do. Yeah. Well, well, we do that about our work, don't we? If, if we're passionate about exactly. the work, we, we go over and uh, above. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, architects need to get in touch with me and let me let me let me know who they, who they are and about their work. Um, we've still got more centres to do, um, hopefully. Yeah. Do you see it expanding a lot more than it is now? Because obviously, you're, you, I guess, you reach a peak capacity within any given, um, I suppose, region or country, in that you're sort of you have a centre for every major cancer centre. Well, there center. are sixty cancer centres in the UK, so actually, there's still quite a lot of places that we're <laughs> plenty <laughs> left. Yeah, and the rest of the world there. to conquer as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what? You got one coming up in Norway as well. Is that right? Yeah. So we've got a group there who are working on. Um, I think they've just about secured a site at Stavanger and um, and also working on a site in Oslo. Um, Is that with local architects? They haven't chosen the architects yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Snoeta are um, advising on the sites, um, but I don't think they're going to be the architect. But we'll we'll, we'll see. <laughs> and obviously, we we have a, a wonderful Snoeta building in Aberdeen, and and actually, you know, part of choosing. Snoeta for Aberdeen was also, you know, who who better to understand the northern sort of landscape, um, the, the the challenges of the the weather and the light and the winter, and also the synergies of the the the, the two um, of of the oil industry and um, you know the Norwegian influence in Aberdeen is very, very strong. So actually, it was a it was a very beautiful relationship on on all sorts of uh, levels. Mm. And in terms of your fundraising at the moment, have you seen a big dent from COVID? Um, yes, income is down, um, um, but we're okay. As in, where our centres are open and we're delivering the care that we need to. Um, so. So yes, if any anyone mm -hmm. out there would like to do some sort of mad cycling adventures a fundraising thing please I was going to please say how, how can people best get involved with fundraising for Maggie's well there's all sorts of things people do their own thing and or join some of the things that um, uh, we, we've sort of organized so 
just get in touch with us and we can help support you in whatever thing that you might like to um, to do. And you know, we're, we're we're just lucky that people are incredibly inventive and and generous with their with their time and money, knowing that everyone has been affected by the impact of COVID in this in this time. Well, I hope you manage to raise more awareness with the new hospitals coming of uh, the importance of architectural quality in, in uh, medical buildings, I suppose. And uh, good luck with all of the fundraising as well. Thank you so, very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much.